Intonation! What is intonation? <laughs> intonation in music refers to pitch accuracy and a musician's ability to play in tune. So music can sound too sharp or too flat or even sharp and flat. If a chord's being played and both notes are like a little bit off from what is considered accurate pitch. So that's what intonation means. It seems pretty straightforward and simple and most people would be happy with that definition and move on with life. But I think it, intonation is such a complex topic that that simple definition really doesn't do it justice. It's, there's a lot more stuff going on. And so that's what this video is about. A lot of people would wonder, what does it mean to play in tune? What is pitch accuracy really? Is there some kind of standard for what in tune might sound like? And if there is a standard, who set that standard? Does using vibrato, which is when a musician deliberately bends the notes pitch, does that mean the musician has good or bad intonation? They're essentially playing part of the note out of tune. <laughs> and why is auto-tune so popular in this multi-billion dollar music industry? Is that the standard for pitch accuracy? These are all really deep questions that a lot of people may wonder at some point in time. And questions like these open up a huge, huge can of worms when it comes to the music industry. Intonation actually becomes a very, very complex topic because there are actually different interpretations of intonation all around the world. And different instruments are actually tuned using different intonation theories. And commonly used pitch Benchmarks have historically changed over hundreds of years. So what is currently considered an in tune note in Europe, for example, is a different pitch note entirely from what was commonly accepted as an in tune note in Europe during, say, like the 1600s. And that's probably really confusing. <laughs> it makes no sense, especially if you aren't already a musician probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's take a few steps back and start with science because science can help explain a lot. <laughs> Sound, according to physics, is measured as a wave. Sound waves may sound familiar. Sound is produced when something vibrates in a medium and a medium could be anything like air, water, solid wood, a wall. Sound waves must have a medium to travel through. There is no sound in a vacuum because there would be no medium. The air doesn't exist, so the sound waves would not be able to vibrate through the air to travel anywhere. <laughs> waves are made up of a few components. Wavelength, which is how long the wave is before it repeats its pattern again. Speed, how fast the wave travels through the medium it's in. The frequency, which is how many wavelengths can happen in a set amount of time. Amplitude, which is how attenuated or squished the wave is, or rather think of along the lines of like audio volume. So a louder sound has a bigger amplitude than a quieter sound. There are two kinds of waves. We have longitudinal waves, which can be demonstrated with a slinky. <laughs> it's when the thing creating the wave moves in the same direction as the wave is traveling. And then the other type of wave is a transverse wave, which is demonstrated by shaking a rope up and down. The thing creating the wave moves in a perpendicular direction to the direction of the wave. Sound waves are thought to move through the air like longitudinal waves or like the slinky wave. Think of like little vibrating pulses through the air like slinky rather than little wiggly lines. A cool thing is that waves can combine just like any other wave in physics. So scientists know a lot about them. One way waves combine is called constructive interference, which is when the peaks and troughs of both waves complement each other or align well. A form of constructive interference often happens during pleasant sounding musical chords. Perfect constructive interference in the music world doesn't create dissonance when you hear the chords. Waves can also combine what's considered destructive 
interference. And the waves are essentially out of phase with each other when they're added together. Perfect destructive interference means that the peaks of one wave align perfectly with the troughs of another wave. And the waves essentially cancel each other out when they're combined because they're opposite waves being added together. If sound waves are perfectly out of phase with each other, the combined sound wave would create <laughs> perfect silence, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to think about, right? Can that even happen in real life? And the answer is yes, because this is how noise canceling headphones work. They use the concept of destructive interference to cancel out the sound that you hear around you. More likely in music, however, combined waves won't have perfectly destructive interference like that, and instead the peaks and troughs are only slightly off with each other. When they combine, they create louder and quieter beats in the sound, which sounds like dissonance, depending on how close the beats are and stuff. But how can we apply this information to figuring out what good intonation or good pitch accuracy is and how can we use it to improve our own intonation? This is where things get a little bit crazy. So since we know sound is a wave, then every pitch can be measured at a particular frequency, which we've learned is how many wavelengths are squeezed into a set amount of time as the wave travels through the air. These frequencies can be measured on any sound, whether it's the rumbling of your refrigerator, clapping of your hands, the sound of drums, knocking on the wall, singing, playing an instrument. If it makes a sound, then it has a frequency that can be measured to determine the sound's pitch. A sound that has a higher sounding pitch has a higher frequency, and the frequency is often referred to as units of hertz, rather than like speed over wavelength, which is like some weird abstract thing to think about. So <laughs> I play the violin, so I'm going to use violin a lot as an example for this intonation discussion. It's an instrument that doesn't have frets, which makes it an interesting instrument to discuss intonation with. You may often hear violinists say they tune their A string to 440, but what does that mean? <laughs> this is another way of saying that they set their third highest string, the A string's pitch frequency, to 440 hertz. 440 is a frequency. Sometimes they'll tune to 441, or 442, or 439, changing it adds a little brightness of sorts. All they're doing is changing their string's bass pitch frequency. And actually, in 1975, the International Organization for Standardization made 440 hertz the standard A tuning for music. In the past, during the Baroque period, which was Europe during the 1600s, the concept of standardizing pitches wasn't as easy as it is nowadays with our electronic tuners and smartphone apps. And a was usually tuned lower than our current pitches, and it mostly depended on the local tuning fork that was being used as a pitch reference. Usually, like, Baroque tuning nowadays refers to an A equaling around 415 hertz, and that's mostly based on tuning forks from that era but they also have found tuning forks with different pitches. And so this goes to show that the current standard of 440 hertz is actually really sharp compared to what a lot of these classical, baroque, even romantic composers used. So there's actually a, quite a lot of leeway for musical interpretation and historical accuracy when it comes to what pitches you're using. So, now to make it even more convoluted and crazy, sometimes orchestras tune very sharp. Sharper than 440, sharper than 441. They pick like 445, 446 as their like A pitch to use to sound sh like brighter and edgier. And it's kind of silly, <laughs> but all of this is to say that the benchmark A pitch for strings is very much open to interpretation. 
And it really depends more on your playing environment rather than some standard that the, <laughs> the International Organization, Organization for Standardization set. Um, if you're playing with a group, it's better to tune to, to what the group is doing. If they're playing sharp or flat, then the musicians need to adjust their instrument to blend in with the group as a whole because intonation sounds much more accurate when it's decided to like among the group rather than each individual. So as an example, perhaps you can imagine an entire violin section of the orchestra asked to whip out a tuner and pick their favorite A to tune to that's between 415 and I don't know, 465 hertz, all of which have been like acceptable A pitches at some point in time. And then have all the violinists play their A at the same time as a sectional. When all of their sound waves combined, there'd be quite a lot of dissonance because they're all slightly different frequencies. And it's not like they're, it's not enough of a gap to create like constructive interference. It'd just be a bunch of destructive interference. And instead of being that like cool, jazzy dissonance that's often accepted, it'd most likely from an audience perspe perspective be considered like, bad dissonance because the single goal note, the A, that they're all aiming for, everyone would have a slightly different interpretation of that and they'd all be playing at the same time and so they would be labeled as playing out of tune. Um, maybe excessive note variation at some day, at some point in time would be considered acceptable but right now for modern listeners it's not considered a very enjoyable thing to listen to. But here's another thing to keep in mind that just contradicts what I just said. String sections in general, since they're not using a fretted instrument, nobody really plays the exact same note every single time together as a section. And it's actually accepted by audiences to have slight note variation. That slight dissonance kind of creates that string vibe, that singing string vibe that a lot of people really enjoy from orchestras. And so there's this range of note variation that sounds good, but there's an unspoken threshold of pitch variation where string sections go from like sounding good to being labeled as playing out of tune. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're playing with other people. There's some variation that's okay, and then there's a threshold where it doesn't quite sound that good anymore. And then also, the other thing to think about is when you're playing in an orchestra, there's harmonization of the different parts across the whole orchestra. Each section is playing a different melody line or harmony line. And so the harmonization of the orchestra as a whole also needs to sound in tune. And so the different chords that are being played and the distance between the notes and how those frequencies combine is a whole other side of intonation to think about. Chord harmonization and the spacing of frequencies is where intonation starts to get really complicated <laughs> because there's different intonation theories to pick from. And the one that sounds the best, that's up for interpretation. <laughs> so that's that's getting into complicated stuff. So let's take a break from talking about strings and orchestra and all that. And let's take a look at pianos, since it's an instrument many people have seen and are somewhat familiar with. The notes are set to stone, so to speak. You just push a note and it's the note, right? You don't have to worry about intonation, or do you? Chords in the piano seem straightforward. Well, Modern pianos are tuned to what is referred to as tempered tuning or equidistant tuning. And it's basically when there are 12 possible tones in the Western chromatic scale and each note has an equal distance from the note above and below, with octaves being in tune with each other. This kind of um, tuning uh, has been adopted across the globe and it's a very common tuning in many different countries. The thing about timbre tuning or having the 12 notes spaced equally apart like this is that the note frequencies and sound waves actually do not add perfectly together. The spacing of the notes was made purely out of convenience in being able to change up keys however you want and have everything sound slightly off 
but enough to where you don't really notice. <laughs> so this means that when you play a chord on a piano, there is dissonance that really shouldn't be there. Octaves are perfect, but the chords are not really in tune with what would be the natural intuitive idea of what that chord should sound like. So especially if it's a chord that should have <laughs> that perfect rounded sound. So like fifths and thirds, chords that usually shouldn't have dissonance. Yet this out of tune way of playing chords is the standard. This is what musicians have to like adjust to. So whenever you're listening to the radio, or they're most likely using tempered tuning, auto-tune often snaps pitches to the tempered tuning frequencies. <laughs> it's a very flexible interpretation of intonation because you can transpose and play in any key signature or musical scale, and you don't have to retune your instrument. So it's been adopted everywhere. The natural, like, intuitive note type of tuning is often referred to as just intonation. Just intonation uses the concept of maintaining exact integer ratios rather than note spacing within a scale to create chords. So a three to two ratio would be considered a perfect fifth in just intonation scales and there's also like perfect fourths, major thirds, minor thirds, and all of these would have a different ratio that when you're using just, in, just intonation, there's no dissonance. It actually sounds very pleasant and different from what we're used to hearing in this tempered intonation world. The dissonance that usually happens during chords that we hear nowadays doesn't happen in a lot of the just intonation chords. So maybe now you can start to see why musicians with instruments that do not have set notes or frets, they naturally start to slip into this non-dissonance way of interpreting music. It's more intuitive, it feels more natural, but it's actually out of tune when you play it with the piano that has been tuned to temper tuning. So one way to demonstrate this is to tune your strings in the fifths and then try playing a first finger on the D string, this is an E, you have to move the E slightly flat for it to sound like a good E chord. But then if you go back and try to play it with the A, it'll sound like the E is flat. You have to move it sharp slightly for it to sound like a better chord. And so this is where temper tuning bridges the differences and makes it so we don't have to keep shifting our notes to get those perfect chords. But we also never get perfect chords with temper tuning, so it's kind of a mess, yeah. And it's also why if you ever hear like a string quartet or an acapella group that doesn't have any piano accompaniment, you might hear them singing and it gives you that like ultra in tune, hair stands up on the back of your neck feeling. And it's because they're using just intonation and there's no dissonance and you know, we're not used to hearing that. It's something that's kind of rare. <laughs> So now that I've confused everyone <laughs> with, you know, piano tunings and different types of intonation scales, let's talk about violins again. <laughs> I'm getting even more confused. So standard Western violin tuning means that the violins are tuned in fifths. So the strings are G, D, A, E, and those are the open strings and they're each a fifth apart. Cellos and violas also tune in fifths, but they don't have the E string, they have a C string. So it's C, G, D, A. Um, we've already established that a fifth in just intonation, where the notes are tuned using ratios and there's no dis dissonance, is actually a different note than what is used on a piano in its temper tuning. And it's really fascinating to me because string teachers often teach students to initially tune their instruments using a tuner. Let's wait for the motorcycle. <laughs> 
So <laughs> the tuner is actually using a strict tempered tuning type of tuning. But later, as they progress into being an intermediate string student, the teacher may say, only tune your A string and then tune your other strings in perfect fifths. And that's when you start to listen to the dissonance and try to remove it entirely. This concept actually goes into another type of intonation theory called the Pythagorean tuning, which is when you tune in perfect fifths while marching around something called the circle fifths until you've played through each of the 12 musical tones. However, the crazy thing with the Pythagorean way of tuning is that once you go all the way around the circle of fifths and you're playing an octave, what should be like a couple octaves different than your starting note, your final note is actually significantly flat compared to what you started with. And that difference in frequency that would make a perfect octave is called the Pythagorean comma. So. <laughs> Violins tune in fifths, but we know that marching around the circle of fifths doesn't give you a perfect octave, which is kind of important. You want your octaves to be right. Luckily, strings only have four strings, but it's still something to keep in mind because a string player tunes in fifths. And as they do that, their lower strings get flatter compared to like a tempered instrument like a piano. So sometimes, especially with viol and cello sections, you'll hear a compo uh, not a composer, a conductor of an orchestra ask their sections um, to tune their C string sharp. And that's because they have that extra fifth lower than the 440A. And so they have that extra fifth Pythagorean commonness to adjust for to get back to a temper tuning similar to what the piano is having. But this also means that a violin's G string sounds a little bit flat compared to a piano's temper tuning. <laughs> Yet it's what we do, like we tune in fifths, it's practiced all over the place with the violin. It's even practiced at those like fancy classical musician composition competitions. So you'll hear the string player match their A string perfectly to the piano's perfectly tempered tuned 440A. But then the string player would like then proceed to tune in fifths and tune their violin to be out of tune with the piano, basically. Um, but it's kind of a question to ask, what is out of tune? Is the piano that's been tuned to a tempered scale of like intonation theory, is that out of tune? Or the musician that just tuned their strings in fifths, is that out of tune? Who knows? So, personal opinion, I personally think it all boils down to one's interpretation of the intonation and what one is trying to achieve while playing the music. And experimenting with intonation <laughs> can help shape uh, the music's feelings and help evoke different emotions from the audience. Um, it creates a slightly different musical atmosphere and vibe depending on what intonation theory the musician picks and what they're trying to create. I thought I'd give an example to put it into context a little bit. One of my favorite folk musicians to listen to and that I wish I could play like is Alistair Fraser, and he produced an album called Fire and Grace. And on that album, there's a set with a song called Huey Shorties, or a tune rather. <laughs> And the B. And you'll notice when he plays the B part, he actually goes up to the high B, kind of flat. And it makes it sound so jazzy and cool. It, I can't quite do what he did, I'll try. 
So I think that's a really good example of manipulating the pitch to kind of create a specific vibe or change of the song that wouldn't be there if you played it with a straight B natural. And it sounds really cool. I've tried to copy it and I just, I don't know how he did it. It just gives it this like really cool jazzy lift to it. And it's, it's awesome. I love it. So. <laughs> So ultimately, what's considered in tune and an accurate pitch and having good intonation is a really complex topic. And although there's this standard of tempered tuning, it's not always what people play in. And it's really kind of up to interpretation as to what type of intonation is most appropriate for that particular situation. And it also shows that if you don't have a fretted instrument, especially with chords, it's really hard to know what is actually in tune because there's so many ideas of what that should be. I kind of think that when a musician uses vibrato that it's a way to like compensate for some of the intonation theory differences but even that's really debatable because it's frowned upon often frowned upon to use int uh, vibrato as a way to try to hide intonation inaccuracies by the same time, intonation itself is a really big, heavy topic that is hard to understand to begin with. And this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the world of intonation. There are so many other forms of intonation theories out there that I didn't even talk about. There's one that has like 52 notes instead of 12. <laughs> and it kind of leads to the question, is tempered tuning the best one to be using right now or the 440 hertz is that the best thing to be using right now what do you think about all this do you have a favorite type of intonation that you think should be the one that is used i'm really kind of curious what other people think i personally think that just intonation, as impractical as it is, with like moving notes depending on what scale you're in, sounds a lot better than tempered intonation. But I also kind of think that just intonation should move with the chords of the music. So if you're playing in D major, but there's a G chord underlying the phrase that you're playing, that you would adjust your notes to be kind of more along the G major scale for that phrase and then the next phrase might be like E minor chord under there and then you adjust to the E minor chord. I don't know, It like a moving just intonation would most likely in my imagination sound the best but that would also be like almost impossible to achieve at least I would find that impossible to achieve because every note would be slightly different. So we've all become like conditioned to accept the slight dissonance of tempered intonation. So yeah, that's my big intonation rant. Needless to say, if your teacher mentions that your intonation doesn't sound very good, <laughs> Which I've had this comment before where I'm playing a song and I think oh, that was that was okay But then my teacher says can you play that again and try to pay a little bit more attention to your intonation? <laughs> that that means that if there is a slight range of like different intonation interpretation theories and such and such that like I didn't land in that range of frequencies. I was more like over here or maybe over here. So like sharp or flat. And there is like a set acceptable range. Um, this video is more like the really slight technicalities behind intonation. And so I would say that if you are having difficulties with intonation, that one of the best things you could do is go over to a piano and like try to match the pitches on the piano. And if you're having a lot of trouble, you can always take out a tuner and match to the tuner. But again, those two methods are using tempered tuning.
Another way to work on intonation if you play violin is, or viola or cello, is to use your open strings as a way to tune to the note you're playing. It gets a little tricky because sometimes the open string wouldn't be in the right chord, so you have to know a little bit about chords to do this properly, but that would move you away from temper tuning and into more of like the just Pythagorean tuning blend that violins tend to use. So tuning your chords and your, even if it's not a chord, just playing a note with an open string and making the like wobbles and dissonance kind of disappear um, would be a way to learn how to play in tune. So those are some ways to work on some intonation. They're both, I think, within that range of acceptable frequencies that would make your teacher happy. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my, my ranty video about intonation. I hope you found that interesting. And if you have anything to add, any information that you know about intonation, I'd love to hear it because it seems to be an infinite topic that there's wide varying like perspectives and opinions about. So yeah, thank you and have a good week. Bye.